word pharisee for philosopher with the Greek. Um, he also gives the name uh, Romas for Hermes later on and Sakulevkus for Asclavios, uh, which suggests that he simply has the, the, um, the consonants and he's supplying vowels more or less at random because he didn't know who Hermes was. <coughs> or Asclavios for that. Aristotle is indeed in the among the bits in the frescoes in Orthodox churches in Burina and in one of the cathedrals in Moscow, uh, in the Kremlin, in fact. But the textual inspiration for this is quite separate Greek work and not the Taina Taina, although in the case of Moscow it could possibly have played a part. All this exotic detail about Aristotle and Alexander and the hidden manuscript certainly suggests esoteric content, but it is not in itself esoteric. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing secret about it, it simply hints at secrets. In fact, if I can uh, steal the title of Alexander's book, um, like Alice in Wonderland, this is something of a grin without a cat. Um, immediately after the translator's introduction, we read Aristotle's first letter, in which he says, uh, we have hinted at the secrets scattered and sealed in this book by means of parables, in case this book should fall into the hands of the unworthy. And if they should learn that which God has not permitted them to know, then I would be breaking the covenant of him who revealed it to me. And I thus swear you to secrecy, just as I was made to promise in this matter. And if anyone should learn this secret and disclose it to the unworthy, he shall be anathema in this world and the next. Lord of hosts, defend us from this. Amen. Now, this last prayer of Aristotle, of course, is ex extremely improbable. <coughs> um, so, we are presented with a text which tries very hard in its first pages to convince the reader that what is follows is highly secret, um, restricted to the elite, and is in fact esoteric doctrine. And the problem here is that the nature of esoteric knowledge is inevitably rather subjective. Uh, what is secret to one person may not be to another. Uh, if what is revealed in the text is indeed new, secret and exciting information, then the writer and the reader are perhaps justified in regarding it as esoteric. Perhaps the mere idea of information designed to be read privately only by a king was enough to make it esoteric. But in fact, most of what follows uh, in the book uh, would have seemed, even in the 15th century, to be no more than rational advice and good common sense. Some of the advice, such as the promotion of ministers and officers according to ability, equal justice for all, and seeking the love of your subjects, might have seemed new and revolutionary in the 15th century, especially in Moscow, but that is not quite the same as esoteric doctrine. The list of chapters of the book may be summarized as follows. First, the different types of Tsar, and he uses the word Tsar, by the way, for king, um, and of course that in itself is a political statement at this time because Ivan III was not Tsar, he was Grand Prince, although he occasionally is called Tsar in some documents. <coughs> he, was never, he was never crowned as Tsar. Um, at the same time, there's plenty of evidence that uh, Ivan had imperial pretensions, uh, regalia, uh, all this stuff about the Third Rome and so on, uh, the adoption of, uh, of um, the uh, imperial eagle uh, is a direct uh, confrontation with the Holy Roman Empire, uh, is inherited from Byzantium and so on. The second chapter is on how the Tsar should conduct himself uh, in public, and among, among his friends, among his courtiers and so on. The third chapter is how to control the nobility and the common people. The fourth chapter is how to select governors of, and officers. The fifth is about the conduct of ambassadors abroad. The sixth is on generals and soldiers. The seventh, conduct of war and how to remain in good health. And the eighth is special wisdoms, stones and herds. Of these, the first six chapters are moral, political, political and military advice, with occasional philosophical references to reason, moderation and the superiority of the intellect. Only here and there are there passages which hint at occult science, which would have been contrary to Christian teaching. The first piece which hints at secret knowledge is the so-called circle of the sphere, 
in which Aristotle says he has enclosed in cryptic form the essence of his knowledge. The actual circles are omitted from the Russian text, but, as Professor Tauba has demonstrated, they must have been in the Hebrew original because they were circulated as a separate text in Russian under the title of Laodikiske Poslania, the Epistle to the Laodiceans. Why this name was attached to it is not really known, but presumably, presumably this was uh, another piece of mystification to make the piece appear to be a piece of um, wisdom retrieved from antiquity. In fact, the epistle of Paul to the Laodiceans is what some Christian Bible scholars at one time uh, thought to be a lost epistle and um, made up the, the lack by um, creating a, an epistle from other quotations of Paul. The reason why um, anyone thought there was a, a, a letter to the Laodiceans, uh, which is in Anatolia by the Laodicea Anatolia, was that uh, in his letter to the Colossians, he said he had written a separate letter to them. <coughs> the Russian Poslania has in fact nothing to do with Paul, it's not occult in any way, and in any case, uh, Paul, often called the Apostle of the Gentiles, was a universalist who did not offer secret doctrines for the elite. This text has been written about quite a lot. Jacob Solomon and Chelourier more or less established the official interpretation of this text in the later Soviet period when he claimed that it was a humanist statement of the freedom of human intellect and thus a sign of Renaissance influence in Russia. Uh, this is still often repeated by historians who have never read the original works. The Taina Tainek does indeed say things elsewhere about the relationship of the human soul and the divine, but this has nothing to do with humanism. It is more probably taken from the Ikhwana Safa. Included in the second chapter on ministers is a passage which does begin to resemble esoteric doctrine. Aristotle tells Alexander to study astrology because nothing can happen, nothing can happen, without the power of the stars. And to study astrology is to receive the prophecy of God. And by knowing what the stars foretell, one can make rational decisions about the best course of conduct. This uh, deterministic belief is quite contrary to, to Christian theology. But interestingly, the word used the influence of the stars is spark, which uh, Moshe has suggested um, might indicate some um, Kabbalistic influence. Uh, however, uh, I expect he's simply using a term which was familiar to him, because the actual text, according to Mandalawi, uh, is taken from the uh, Rasayil of the Yukon Masafar, who took it from the emanationary doctrine of Plotinus. Um, so these are emanations uh, with, uh, in Plotinus, which become the sparks in um, Kabbalah. Aristotle returns to this theme later with an anecdote about the son of an Indian king who was forced by astral influences to become a blacksmith, just as the sparks of, uh, of his planet had foretold. In chapter 4 on Offices of State and Tax Gatherers, Aristotle rather incongruously places a discussion of the intellect, the soul, and the body, which sounds like an undeveloped statement of a spiritual doctrine, but I haven't yet uh, determined its source, and it clearly is an incomplete statement. He also gives physiogno phys physiognomical advice, um, that is, um, prediction of character and behavior from um, physical appearance of people. In the Middle Ages, this would almost certainly have been considered esoteric knowledge, uh, thus, Alexander is advised, your minister should be pale with blue eyes, or very dark with blue eyes, or hideous to behold. This passage was later quoted by Ivan Grozny as a reason for mistrusting Prince Kurbsky. <laughs> uh, because he had, uh, well, he had, he had blue eyes, right. apparently, and an Ethiopian in sword. Uh, <coughs> but the truly secret things, uh, as it would have appeared in the Middle Ages, come later in the book. The first is an onomantic table for discovering the winner of a battle in advance by adding up the numbers of the letters in his name and the name of his adversary and comparing them in a table. Uh, onomancy, in case anyone doesn't know, is from the Greek onoma, a name, and is a form of gematria, which could have been influenced by Kabbalah, but in fact was fairly common in all the Mediterranean area wherever alphabetical numerals are used. It, it, it obviously lends itself to this. 
and also among the Orthodox Slav for exactly the same reason that they were using alphabetical numerals. <coughs> this passage in the Russian uh, Tanya Tainik includes two examples of the accuracy of this divination. Alexander beat the Indian king Porus, and the pagan gladiator Laios was beaten by the Christian Nestor. These examples uh, were clearly an interpolation in the Russian version and show that someone had taken the trouble to investigate this text and find suitable examples for it. The onomantic table is divided into vrata, which is also the term used for the chapters of the whole book, Taina Taina, uh, and also in the logic. Yeah. Um, the Taina Taina itself is often referred to as the Aristotle de Vrata, although that title is not found anywhere in the text. This is mainly because the, so the Stoglav Church Council of 1551 includes two books, one called Aristotle and the other called Aristotle, Aristotle Vivrata, in a list of her heretical works, together with the Rafli, which is mainly a geomantic text, and which is also divided into Vrata. And there is considerable confusion about which work is being referred to in later references. It is fairly clear, though, that the Aristotle Vivrata, which was found in the possession of an abbot in a treason case in 1721, was in fact the Taina Tainik, or at least the onomantic table taken from it, and that the abbot also possessed the Rafli and other divinatory material. Uh, he was sent to Solovki for life because his real crime was in paying respect to Peter the Great's divorced first wife. <coughs> Following the onomantic table, you find a physiognomy. Uh, this is, as I say, a method of analyzing character and behavior from physical characteristics. <coughs> Whether this was considered at, at the time to be an occult practice or part of medicine is not entirely clear. Um, quite often, this inclu include the physiognomy of medicine. Well, it was thought medicine because it be after it come uh, the physio physiognomical text by uh, Rhesus uh, and the three medical texts by Maimonides. The onomantic table is not the only quasi-magical element in the Tainai Tainic. Chapter 8 has is entitled of special sciences, hidden secrets, and precious stones. In fact, it contains praise of alchemy as the most necessary wisdom of the king and gives the recipe for making gold. This is the first reference to alchemy in Russian. And we should note here that all the foreign physicians of the Tsars, from Ivan III right up to Alexei Mikhailovich, were in fact expected to be expert in astrology and alchemy. And several, in fact, were killed as, a, uh, as magicians by the Moscow mob. <coughs> After the section on alchemy, we have a section on a magic ring inscribed with a magic sigil, which is very similar to one described in the Arabic grimoire, the Picatrix, which I've already mentioned. This, king makes the king, uh, this ring makes the king universally obeyed and unconquerable, and is definitely in the realm of occult knowledge. The ring is followed by a section on the greatest of all poisons, which is called Bish, or Bashman, and is described as an essentially king. It is in fact aconite. Following this is a list of the magical <coughs> properties of precious stones, which is associated with alchemy, and, and also magic talismans uh, with engravings. This ring would be part of esoteric wisdom. <coughs> Let me now turn to a brief, dis a brief discussion on. I'm all right, aren't I? Yeah, in the, uh, yeah, in the cafe. <coughs> The medical interpretations of Maimonides in this text are the treatise on asthma, the treatise on poisons and antidotes, and the treatise on sex, or more specifically on impotence. Maimonides was the greatest Jewish thinker and scholar of the 13th century, and perhaps the greatest ever. He was born in Spain, uh, but following persecution moved to Morocco and then to Egypt. Um, he's known, by the way, in this text as Moses the Egyptian, uh, which causes a little bit of confusion later on. Um, which, which you can hear in my next lecture if you want to. Um, <coughs> he had a serious financial uh, reverse which forced him to earn his living as a physician, uh, at which trade he was extremely successful and became the personal physician of Saladin's Grand Vizier and then allegedly of Saladin himself. The inclusion of works by Maimonides in the Tainai Tainik is logical if the intended recipient of the work was indeed Ivan III follow the Tauber thesis. 
<clears throat> because he was, after all, a, a royal physician, and the treat his treatises were intended only for the eyes of his patron, or perhaps the Grand Vizier. <coughs> Intellectually, though, it's very curious, because Maimonides was, <coughs> was not inclined to esoteric doctrine. In fact, he's often described as a rationalist in the Aristotelian tradition. His many writings, though, are not so much rationalist as pragmatic and eclectic. He belonged to the so-called empiric school rather than the philosophical school of medicine. His treatment was based mainly on practical experience, natural remedies, and lifestyle advice. And this was probably much more beneficial than the, the more learned, uh, than much of the learned medicine of the Renaissance West, which had turned away from anything scholastic or Arabic or Jewish in favor of what in the Renaissance was considered to be the superior authority of the classics, such as Galen and Hippocrates. Maimonides, in fact, was quite content with the humoral theory of Galen, and himself quotes Galen and Hippocrates when he thinks it's appropriate, mixed in with his herbal remedies and um, advice on temperance and walking up and down for half an hour after lunch and that sort of thing. <coughs> the interpolation of Maimonides' treatise on sex into the Tainaitainic was not at first recognized because the translation is full of euphemisms. Uh, sexual relations are described as mujistva, or todjala, or tavyesh, uh, which confusingly may also mean penis. Uh, so when you're reading this, you're never quite sure what you're reading. Um, and the text may have had some special resonance in Russia. It was written because Maimonides' patron had complained that he was exhausted from trying to satisfy all his concubines and he needed a little medical assistance. From several sources, including Samuel Collins, uh, the physician of Alexei Mikhailovich, we know that sexual difficulties were widely regarded uh, as, witch as a result of witchcraft in Russia in the 16th and 17th centuries. The word kila is, re is recorded by two English visitors to Russia in their glossaries of Russian as being a gross swelling of the testicles caused by witchcraft, and the word seems to have continued to have a combined meaning of hydrocele and impotence for which there were magical charms as remedies, and those were the only remedies. <coughs> uh, and you can get them on the internet, by the way, if you're interested. Um, <coughs> Ivan Grozny is reported to have suffered in this way. Sir Jerome Horsey, the, the English um, trader and diplomat who was present, the, present at the death of the Tsar, says of the cause uh, of this um, uh, malfunction was the great overindulgence Ivan of Ivan in deflowering more than a thousand virgins. Uh, I'd like to think that Ivan, who we believe uh, read the Tainaitainic, because he quotes it, um, perhaps read Maimonides' remedy, which was a mixture of diet, moderation, psychological advice on creating the right mood for sex, and several herbal aphrodisiacs, and perhaps even benefited from the treatment. <coughs> to finish, yes, to finish, uh, I hope that I've shown that whether or not Zechariah really did want to convert the Muscovites to Judaism by impressing them with his scholarship, and however odd his choice of texts to translate may have been, the Tainer Tainik was really quite a good choice, because it contains which might flatter the Grand Prince by comparing him with Alexander and so on, might intrigue him because of the secret knowledge and so on, uh, and impress him. Although most of the underlying text is not, in fact, Jewish, this is not made evident. The medical inter interpolations certainly are Jewish, and the whole product can certainly be claimed to have had an effect on Russian culture and medicine. The Tainer Tainik was the first manual of kingship in Russia, the first to offer esoteric wisdom outside the church, the first to advocate the study of astrology and alchemy, the first to offer magical tools such as onomancy, talismans, magic rings, uh, magic gemstones, the first to teach the secrets of physiognomy, and the first to offer detailed medical and health advice with formulas for medication. It was the first to teach military tactics, including the use of firearms and elephants, which wasn't particularly helpful in, in Russia, uh, and the first to tell Russians on how to are a sick horse. The book is found in multiple copies in the 18th century and is cited or extracted in many, especially in 17th century Lechevnik. Uh, which mostly were translated originally from German. And this is, I think, quite an impressive example of Jewish-Slavic interaction. And then I will stop and will accept any comments or questions. With the Greek.
take five minutes of, of your time. Okay. Six. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, first, uh, I believe what you're trying to do is quite, it's quite fascinating because you are but really uh, showing to what extent the texts considered before esoteric texts really uh, should be reclassified or at least revisited as uh, very problematic from the point of view of uh, the tradition that we associate with Hermesis Trismegistus or with the esoteric texts. And, and from this point of view, if this is the intellectual rep of your uh, 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 presentation, so I, 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 I'm very much supportive. It, it really um, fascinates me as something parallel to what I'm doing. I'm working on, on a number of late 17th, early 18th century um, quasi um, esoteric texts yes. of, of Balei Shem, of the, of the practical vagabond uh, Jewish Kabbalists. And from this text, uh, it's, uh, from these texts, it's quite it's quite clear that that the uh, people who we call Kabbalists and uh, associate with uh, uh, charismatic charlatans, uh, they are really um, working on the cutting edge of the uh, natural medicine uh, and are very close to um, paramedics and to pharmacology of their time. So I, I think this is, this is a very productive trend uh, to look at uh, dynamic, dynamic from the perspective of the science of its time. Uh, having said that, I would like to uh, also mention something that would, uh, to some extent, uh, justify uh, uh, Lourier's approach to the book. When Lourier calls the book, looks at the book within the tradition of, of uh, Renaissance humanism, it's, um, it is acceptable, I believe, from at least two viewpoints. First, he cannot talk in the Soviet context about any kind of esoteric tradition. That would be a taboo. Yes, so, right, not, number one. So that's why he chooses a, a context that would somehow describe a place or class or help him to classify the book. And this context he chooses quite uh, cleverly, and I would say even uh, uh, shrewdly, because when he started to look at the, uh, when he started to enumerate a list of this um, um, ethical teachings of what actually Aristotle is trying to tell, quasi Aristotle is trying to tell, quasi Alexander. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it strikes me as being uh, just a version of uh, of uh, Machiavelli's Prince. This is how Machiavelli uh, teaches um, what has to be done uh, by a manager of the state. This is these are ethical principles of the manager of the state that certainly go back to the tradition, to the tradition of wisdom, uh, to the tradition of, of uh, scribal tradition. Scribes teach uh, uh, monarchs, kings, whoever they are in, in in antiquity. But this is a different story. I, I do believe that the idea <coughs> does find a, a very accurate depiction. If, if not, Machiavelli okay, can believe Alberti with his attempt to teach people how to uh, troll the situation, how to behave uh, to one another. It's, it's also a Renaissance style of literature. Uh, three, um, I think we are dealing today with a new version of what Jewish medieval texts are all about. And, um, just by chance, uh, I, uh, I happen to, 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 to have read the uh, dissertation of Shama Boyarin, uh, who wrote about the Aristotelian-centric Hebrew literature, philosophical literature of the medieval times. But by Aristotle, he does not mean the Aristotle of Maimonides or the Aristotle of, uh, of Ibn Gvirol. He means the Aristotle of the um, Alexander Romance. Yeah. And he means, um, he, he, he builds the entire corpus of genre, the entire system of genre in medieval Hebrew literature, mm -hmm. putting it around the center and the focus of the center is Alexander Romance. And this, this is a fascinating thing because if you look at the um, number of circulating manuscripts, you would have probably tens of manuscripts uh, of, uh, or probably more than ten, several dozen of manuscripts of, of uh, Mishnah Torah, of Memorius, um, several dozen of manuscripts of, of philosophical works by, uh, by, Kuhn, by, by Yehuda Halevi or by Yehuda but you have probably hundreds 
of different versions of Alexander Romanos. So Alexander Romanos becomes a, a sort of, of a mass culture yes. uh, in, in, in this Hebrew reading world um, of medieval times, and we don't know that much about it. Not only Hebrew, but it's the Arabic world and uh, the 300 manuscripts uh, of the Alexandria of Russia. So it's a universal phenomenon. Right. If it is a universal phenomenon, then we're coming to my third point. And my third point of... of Four. Okay, I have two, two, I have two minutes. My, my third point is about um, the, um, the unique role of Aristotelian tradition in medieval times. You know, Aristotle is, is claimed uh, by um, too many and um, is associated with too many different things at, at the time. I don't remember, unfortunately, how he appears in Dante's uh, Limbo. But I do remember that in Lozinski's translation of Dante's Limbo, he appears as Uchitel Vsiach Kto Znayet. What does it mean, Uchitel Vsiach Kto Znayet? For, for anybody, certainly you know Uchitel Vsiach Kto Znayet, uh, uh, Maestro di, di Tutti, chi, chi. I, I, I would not translate back into it. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> okay. Pardon? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but, but at any rate, at any rate it's, it's, it's very important that Uchitra Tiakto Znaya is not only a reference to a rational tradition of, of uh, Aristotelian uh, you know, uh, wisdom, but it is also a reference to something esoteric because Tiakto Znaya, Znaya, Sto. Do they know? Do they know what? So Lazinski captures very, very deftly the the, the, the the double meaning of of Dante's line, because as we know, for instance, before Maschilim came to uh, uh, to take uh, Judaism to to take Judaism astray in the 19th century, whatever we mean by Judaism, uh, Moshe, uh, Maschilim in, in 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 the medieval times meant, meant actually Kabbalists. The Kabbalists usually address one another by masculine. Um, um, pardon? Or or, well, that I do not know. That's, that, that is beyond my, uh, you know, I, 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 I pretend to know. I, I can't say that I pretend to know. <laughs> but, uh, so, so Aristotle um, appears at the same time as a Kabbalistic, an a mystical, a, an esoteric thinker, and at the same time as a rational thinker. What's the problem? The problem is that we see that as contradictory, as a contradictio in argumento. They did not. My feeling is that one, and again I'm coming back to my first point, when we deal with the esoteric texts and we say, oh, it's an esoteric tradition, it's your message, it has nothing to do with the rational knowledge, it's um, to say um, anti aristotelian really anti-Aristotelian tradition, or is it so, so I think that, 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 that we impose our dichotomy of what is rational, what is esoteric, on the situation which did not see this particular uh, uh, division. And, and my, my last point is, um, yeah, I don't have the last point. yeah, my last point is, is that that uh, so last, last point. right, last point. Last point. Yeah, I have always a an ultimate point. Yeah, you only have two, three, three uh, third points. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, I believe, uh, according to historical, to, 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 to what we know about the late days of Maimonides, after David died, uh, traveling with uh, with diamonds in the Indian Ocean, uh, David, brother of of of, 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 uh, of Maimonides, um, he became the daughter of the nephew of Salahuddin, Salahuddin, and, and not really the, the of, of Salahuddin. There seems to be a variety of opinions on, on this, but I, I doubt your superior knowledge. <coughs> okay. Uh, do I have time to respond to this, or does somebody else wish to make May points? I really In fact, we have a holy group who is running around uh, several angels, one of which Just adding to the point. Okay. Could you, could you develop that, please? Well, uh, 
Alexander is uh, one of the uh, most important figures uh, in the world. The uh, story of Alexander uh, is central. I respond to one or two points. First, uh, on Neil Laurier, uh, I know exactly why Laurier um, wrote the way he did because I, I talked to him about it. Um, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the reasons why he wrote it and the truth are, are two separate things. He wrote it because he was under, under uh, not spoken pressure but self censorship. Um, but in fact, uh, to suggest that. Uh, the Judaic translations were the work of a um, humanist group uh, in southwest Russia, which is the way he put it, uh, is really nonsense. Uh, this is not humanist literature. Um, when you say that, uh, yes, people have, or have different kinds of Aristotle, it's true, but not the same people. Uh, the, the, the Renaissance scholars um, did not uh, believe that the, that the Alexander romance was, was, uh, was, was truth. They regarded it as right. Um, there's, a, there's a big difference between uh, Jewish legends and, and Jewish philosophy. There's a big uh, difference between Renaissance uh, uh, classicists, uh, Renaissance humanists, uh, and, um, uh, and tellers of, of, of stories. And I, I don't think you're necessarily talking about the same people. The Aristotelian tradition is tremendously important. Uh, it's the one thing that does survive from scholastic tradition into the university world, at least uh, of the post scholastic period. Um, Partly because uh, Aristotelianism is very taxonomic. It's very useful for universities. It's a good way to design a course in a university. You, uh, you can't do this with Plato. Uh, the, the whole tradition of, um, uh, of debate in universities is Aristotelian. Even after you've lost uh, immediate respect for Aristotle after the Renaissance, in the 17th century in Oxford, uh, a teacher could actually be punished for publicly contradicting Aristotle. Uh, this is, I, I know this sounds extraordinary. Um, the the um, Aristotelian style of debate for, uh, was, was still being practiced in the Kiev Academy in the 18th century. Um, so there's a very strong survival of, of, of that kind of scholastic Aristotelianism for a long time. But this wasn't the way that the scholars had gone. This may be an organizational method within universities. And Aristotle may still be being taught, and the uh, Jesuits may still be promoting Aristotelianism, uh, the commentaries on Aristotle, and so on. But um, I, I think it must be clear that, that um, what you have, I mean, by the time of the Renaissance, nobody, no serious scholar in Italy uh, was working on Azali, uh, was working on Maimonides, uh, was working on uh, medieval Aristotelian texts. Um, gone back to the classics uh, for, for good I mean, they, they, they threw away a lot of very good <coughs> particularly good medicine uh, Jewish medicine was thrown at this time uh, and, and uh, in Europe suffered for it uh, but humanism is, humanism means going back to the classics that's what, that's what his definition is uh, humanist studies means that Latin and Greek and these people uh, who were translated, it is uh, Zechariah, uh, if he had friends, and if, if he was a, a good Jewish mystics in, in, in Vilnius or whatever, um, they were not humanists, uh, not, not, not in some sense. They were, the whole thing is medieval. This is medieval literature, this is um, medieval legend, uh, this is medieval medicine. The fact that it was superior to the classical medicine is another matter. But it's still, uh, Maimonides is still medieval medicine, uh, as far as Europe is concerned. And uh, that is why I think uh, Laurier was wrong, and those who repeated Laurier on this particular point uh, are wrong. Um, and I'll stop there. Possibly Moshe wishes to say something. No, 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 I just want to make a small remark. Uh, one of the things that Laurier did, which is <laughs> scenarios which yeah. very kindly we thought were startling or surprising. And I think out of friendship maybe nobody wants to say that I was crazy. <laughs> okay. No, we think Zakaria, but uh, 
Zechariah the man, crazy he was, he was saying something that I never said, that uh, ah. Zechariah started with Moses. No, and, uh, Did you not no, say that? No, we don't know. Uh, since they lived in the same city at the same time, ah, they I think knew each know. other, that's sure. Uh, but I don't think that... Yeah, so we know that that's Sorry? We know the manuscript of, of Zechariah uh, with, with Moses. Well, yes, yes, so they knew each other, but that doesn't yeah. mean that... Okay, I, I apologize. No, so, sorry, sorry. Okay, so just out of... Uh, no, I read too much into your book. Yes, yeah. 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 What about Alexander in the churches of Bovina? What kind of churches? Uh, not Alexander, but Aristotle. I saw where? Which kind of churches? These are... Um, Yes, there are all these. I saw them last year. Orthodox. Oh, these, these are Orthodox. Uh, orthodox. Yes, these are Orthodox. And they are all, they are all think, monastic churches. And they include um, Plato and Aristotle in the list of prophets. Okay, so you have 12, 12 major you prophets. You mean the Romanian side? Yes. Sorry? You were in book nine. Uh, this is a, yes, this is in Romania, in Romanian uh, book of Romania. Romania. That's right, Romania. So th th these, these churches. These, these include um, uh, Plato and Aristotle, but not because of, uh, of the secret of secrets, but because of a uh, Byzantine text uh, which um, portrays Plato and Aristotle as foretelling the coming of Christ. Um, this is fairly well established now. Uh, and this is the reason also why they are in the church uh, in the cathedral of the Assumption. I've forgotten which one now. One of the cathedrals in the, in the uh, Kremlin includes them as well, probably for the same reason. But since that is um, uh, late, six, uh, late 16th century, I think, the frescoes, that it is possible then that people already have read The Secret of Secrets and therefore are quite happy to see Aristotle among the prophets. Uh, this is simply speculation on my part. Take five. Um, there was another point I wanted to take up from what you said, and I can't remember what it is now. <laughs> point um, number one, but number two, or number three. <laughs> or number three, this. <laughs> this. <laughs> um, never mind, no, enough. We perhaps um, discuss it. I would only add that uh, the Jewish law of Aristotle uh, is considered as a uh, pupil. Of the robbers. But Aristotle was. Yeah. Uh -huh. I learned everything he knew from the robbers. Oh, th so th this, this is Jewish tradition? Yeah. Uh, we have it actually in the, in the logica. I think I mentioned it in my book, I'm not mistaken, I think in the handout that I gave you, that uh, Aristotle lived at the time of the, the, prophet, the last prophets, and it's not then as they were in physics. I think it's written somewhere or, um, it's an Hellenistic tradition already. No, no. Uh, uh, Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic tradition, certainly yes, uh, but uh, it stands somewhere in the Babylonian tongue. And the Babylonian tongue is not in the. Yes. There is a recent book by, what's his name, Elamet, which is dedicated to this subject that mm -hmm. the that. The, the, the death, this myth that uh, all, 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 the, all the, the science of all the wisdom mm -hmm. go back to, to Solomon. Well, of, of course, uh, the, 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 within the Christian tradition, of course, uh, Christians are very happy to believe that uh, wisdom goes right back to, to Jewish sources. Um, uh, Boyle, for example, is interested in this, this the two kinds of, of saying. Um, I, I think true. Um, but it, it was in the, the tradition of your knowledge was very important, so quite clearly. Uh, you had to give a legitimacy to any belief. Simply being new was not a good idea. Oh, no. You couldn't say, oh, I had a good idea, this is my philosophy. Oh, no. so that's, that's right, that's right. It's, and the same with the Christian Yes, exactly, yes. But all, all these things, they have to have. Uh, 
the, their tradition of wisdom. Um, and this is why, of course, that this this thing about the the um, the Egyptian uh, tradition, uh, which comes through in the Alexandria, that that uh, really uh, this is. The, well, if you remember this, the the, the, the two magicians um, who uh, fought against Moses, uh, Yanis and Yambres, and they're called. Um, this is part of this. There's a strong attempt somewhere among the Egyptians um, to give an anti-Greek line that, that, that uh, it is Egyptian magic and not Greek logic, uh, which is the uh, origin of wisdom. And interestingly enough, that the Alexandria, of course, it actually shows Nectanebus destroying the Greek fleet, if you remember. He has a bowl of water with little ships on it. Mm. And these are, uh, <coughs> simili are similibus. This is, these, are, these ships are images of the of the Greek fleet, uh, and he just—he that's right. He destroys the whole Greek fleet by magic. Now, so th th this is um, the Alexandria. Although it, it comes into uh, into the Slavic lands from from the Greek uh, late Greek versions, the many Greek versions of, of, of the um, uh, pseudo Callisthenes, it is in fact um, propagandizing Egypt as a source of wisdom and not Greece. Um, so uh, it does seem that the, if you like, the the, um, the mythical Alexander, rather than the historic, rather than the historic Alexander, is being recast as, as a magical figure in the Egyptian tradition, and not as a, a Greek figure in the uh, perhaps logical tradition. Uh, I find that particular thing um, very interesting uh, because it, it does occur again this, this thing about um, wisdom coming from from Egypt. I suppose it was very mysterious, the, the, you know, the, the pyramids were very mysterious, and you, you had to believe, I and mean, you still have people inventing wonderful theories about, you know, about the uh, pyramids, uh, aliens, all sorts of things. Mummies. Sorry? Mummies. Mummies, all this, oh yes, of course, it, it, it's a source of tremendous uh, interest. <coughs> I shall stop at that point. Very well. May I first of all uh, thank the Institute of Advanced Study 
for inviting me here as a visiting scholar uh, through the good offices of, of um, Alexander and Moshe. And second, although my Russian pronunciation is probably acceptable to those of you who are Russian speakers, I have to apologize for my pronunciation of the various Hebrew and Arabic words, uh, names and titles, which will appear in my paper and which will, I'm afraid, sound very English. Uh, the same may be true of the occasional bits of Latin and Greek, uh, because the British have been famous for centuries for their very idiosyncratic pronunciation uh, of classical languages. Uh, we have several ways of pronouncing Latin. Wiwat, uh, Regina, uh, is one end of the scale, very classical, and the other end is Vivat Regina, um, which is what they shout out when she was crowned. So th those are the extremes of Latin pronunciation. Uh, I will probably vary between them because um, Latin titles of books tend to be pronounced in a very English way. Let me first tell you how I became interested in the Taina Taina and what it is. In my final year as an undergraduate student at Oxford, I was looking for something interesting as a research topic for postgraduate research, um, rather arrogantly assuming that I would get a good enough degree to qualify. And since I was primarily interested in Russian medieval texts, I looked at the quite good collection of Slavic manuscripts in the Bodleian Library, which is the main university library in Oxford, and was immediately intrigued by a 16th century Russian manuscript described as Secretum Secretorum Aristotelis Russike. I was intrigued partly because I'd never heard of a work of Aristotle called the Secretum Secretorum, and partly because I was surprised that Aristotle was known in Russia at all in the 16th century. <coughs> of course, the prime purpose of a book title like Secret of Secrets is to be intriguing, and I began to do a little bit of reading. Within a week or two, Mahmoud Manzalawi, who was a very learned Egyptian specialist on the English versions of the Secretum Secretorum, uh, found an old library slip uh, <coughs> In, with my name on it in Steele's edition of Roger Bacon's medieval Latin commentary on the Secret and Secretorum, which he too had been reading, and he wondered why I'd taken it out. Um, so uh, he sent me a note through the library assistant um, inviting me to tea, which was the way one used to do things in Oxford. Um, this led to some very useful exchanges of information, and then, much later, a conference on the Secretum at the Warburg Institute in London. Fortunately, I had a colleague there who was a great expert on uh, the Aristotelian tradition in Europe, and we collaborated on this, uh, and it, it produced a very interesting book. <coughs> it also led to many years of friendship with, uh, with Mahmoud, and a very unwise promise to be his living executor. I haven't heard from him for a long time, and I'm <laughs> wondering when I'm going to have to start. <coughs> Moshe Tauber's um, introduction to me was, uh, was slightly different, also by letter, but without an invitation to tea. Um, he had read an article of mine, uh, I can't remember now which one it was, and he sent me a letter uh, with one or two questions and a complaint that I had published my articles in obscure places. He's probably <laughs> forgotten it. Um, I think he meant the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institute. Uh, which for me, as librarian, academic librarian of, of the uh, Warburg Institute in London at the time, uh, represented the supreme pinnacle of studies in the classical tradition. Um, uh, or he may have meant an article I published uh, in a journal called uh, Kirillo Methodianum in Thessaloniki, which really was obscure, uh, but my excuse for that is that it was a, a fest shift for Dmitry Sergeyevich Likachov, who had strongly encouraged me to pursue my interest in Tainai Tainai and in Russian magic. Moshe's letter led to an equally fruitful friendship and collaboration, the joint attempt, which has lasted too many years, I think, um, <coughs> to prepare an annotated variorum edition of the Ruthenian and Old Russian translation of the Secrets of Secrets, that is, Tainai Tainai, with a facing text of the Hebrew version and an English translation. Um, and I'm going to do the typesetting. And this <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a, a major thing. The, the project has been delayed by long intervals for both of us, by professional responsibilities, families, other projects, and the sheer difficulty of the text. We are now hoping to give the project some new impetus during my stay here, perhaps even finish it before we die. 
<coughs> what I'm going to say today will touch on some of the points which will eventually have to be dealt with in our preface to the edition. So what is this Secretum Secretorum, Kitab Sir al Secret of Secrets, Sod Hasadot, and finally Taina Tainech? For those who are unfamiliar with the Taina Tainech, which is probably most of you, um, <coughs> apart, of course, <laughs> from Moshe, um, <coughs> let me give you a quick background account. The Taina Tainech, the Secret of Secrets, belongs rather loosely in the genre known as uh, Fürstenspiegel, or Mirror of Princes. It purports to be a manual of instruction in the form of letters, aphorisms, anecdotes, from the greatest of philosophers, the venerable Aristotle, to his pupil, the greatest of kings, Alexander the Great, written in response to a request from Alexander as he was about to set out on his campaign into Persia, Central Asia, and India. This advice includes a wide range of topics, moral instruction, some extremely pragmatic and even ruthless political advice, military advice, including secret weapons and psychological warfare, a great deal of medical, dietetic, and lifestyle advice, information on astrology, alchemy, physiognomy, poison, magical amulets, and the magical med medical virtues of precious stones, and a magical system to forecast the winner of battles. Obviously, of great value to a king. <laughs> <coughs> this knowledge is represented as being esoteric, hence the very pretentious title of the Supreme secrets, the ultimate secret knowledge essential for a ruler and never to be shown to the uninitiated under threat of anathema. The earliest versions of this work are in Arabic, this is the Kitab Sir al-Asra, and the Arabic text claims to be translated from Greek through Syriac. There is a short form and a probably later long form of the text, which has uh, accretions um, from other places. Uh, there are no two versions exactly the same. If the writer of the text is indeed uh, Yahya ibn al bitrik as is claimed in the, in the introduction, then he was a Christian Greek uh, living in Baghdad who was one of a group of scholars given the task of obtaining books of philosophy and science from Greece for <coughs> Caliph al-Mamun, the son of Harun al-Rashid, at the beginning of the ninth century. <coughs> However, we have no evidence that a Greek text ever existed and the Arabic texts which survive show evidence of an original letter of Aristotle to Alexander taken from a collection of Arabic pseudo-epistles followed by a gradual accretion of material from various sources including the Rasail, the encyclopedia of that very curious secret society of scholars known as the Ikhwan as Safa or the Brethren of Purity in the 10th century. <coughs> Just in case you think I've read that uh, I haven't. Uh, I do not read Arabic. It, I gather, is a difficult text, and for many years it has been claimed to be translation. Um, I think it's been supposed to be published eventually by the Oxford University Press, but so far, uh, nothing. Both the long and short versions of the Kitab Sir al Asra were translated from Arabic into Latin in Spain, first, first in the 12th century by John of Seville and again in the 13th century by Philip of Tripoli. And there are very many vernacular versions in most European languages. There are at least nine separate translations into English, for example, two of them in verse. <coughs> in fact, in the Middle Ages, it was probably the most read Aristotelian work, although its authenticity was rejected by most scholars by about 1550. It was rejected completely from the Aristotelian canon. Uh, the last publication of the Latin text was by a very conservative scholar known as Francesco Storella in 1555. Um, it was never published after that as an Aristotelian text. The version of The Secret of Secrets was also translated into Hebrew. Moses Gaster, the first publisher of the Hebrew text, thought that the translator was uh, Judah al-Harizi in the 12th, 13th century, although this has been challenged by Amitai Spitzer, who was um, a student at the Warburg Institute and took part in our conference there, he said on stylistic grounds that if it had been Harisi, it would have been done better. Um, I don't know how good an argument this is, but um, <laughs> he did seem to know what he was talking about. Harisi is a brilliant, brilliant like writer. Who writes yes, uh, I know he has a very high stylist. In, in, in the rhymed prose. Uh, 
Yes, well, it's absolutely excellent. I, I think the, the, the Hebrew um, secret of secrets is not as good as that. Yeah. So he's probably right. <coughs> it is this um, Hebrew version which rather unexpectedly was translated somewhere in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in the later part of the 15th century into a variety of Slavonic which has variously been described by different scholars as West Russian with Polonisms, Middle Yellow Russian, Ruthenian, or even in one case, Old Ukrainian. Professor Tauber has finally settled on the description heavily Polonized Ruthenian. In English, yes. It sounds okay, does it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I shall frequently refer to it in, in this lecture simply as Russian because it's more convenient. And in any case, most of the copies are actually in, in Muscovite. Um, Slavon, with a mixture of uh, Russian and uh, very Slavonicized Russian. <coughs> the identification of Hebrew as the source language of the Slavic translation was first made by Sobolevsky in 1903. This was challenged by some other scholars, but the linguistic and textual evidence for a Jewish source is conclusive. In any case, it, was, it is fairly clear that this is one of the group of texts labeled by Sobolevsky as the literature of the Judaizers, uh, a label which is still attached to it, because it is associated with the alleged Judaizing heresy in the late 15th century in Novgorod and Moscow. These texts included the Hebrew <coughs> astronomical tables, the Six Wings, by the 14th century Jewish mathematician uh, Emmanuel ben Yaakov Bonfis of Tarascon, a Hebrew version of the very popular 13th century Latin cosmographic textbook, the De Sfera of Sacra Bosco, which was the standard textbook in the West up to the 16th century, a school textbook, that is. <coughs> um, two treatises on logic, one by Al-Ghazali, the other by Ascribed to Maimonides, and we are awaiting Professor Tauber's monumental edition and study of this material, which I gather is now being indexed. Um, this will make him very famous, but not, not very rich, I think. <laughs> <coughs> A further text, known as the Laodicean Epistle, may be added to the list of Judaizer texts. It has now been convincingly identified, again by Professor Tauber, who knows all about all this, as the spiritual circle, a list of moral maxims which is referred to in the Tainai Tainich and found in the Hebrew and Arabic texts, but not in fact contained in the Russian text of that work, and I shall mention that again later. <coughs> The particular copy of the Hebrew version of the Secret of Secrets, which was the source of the Slavic translation, is not extant, but must already have contained the major interpolations found in all the Russian manuscripts. These are uh, Physiognomy by uh, Rezi, Al Razi, um, three rather abbreviated translations of medical treatises by Maimonides, um, a short letter on how to treat the illness of Alexander's horse Bucephalus and several other short interpolations of unknown origin, so far unknown anyway, we may get round to it, um, some of which have a scholastic colouring, and some of which Professor Tauber has characterised as explanatory material intended to give a particular ideological slant to the text. Some copies of the Slavic translation have, as an appendix, a short life of Aristotle derived from a Latin version of the Greek Lives of the Philosophers by Diogenes Laertius. One or two have an extra introductory passage explaining the connection between Alexander and Aristotle with information taken from the Slavonic Alexander romance. The only publication of the whole text was that of uh, Speransky in 1908, and the most serious review of that edition was by Krimsky in the Ethnographiska Zrenia in 1910, who pointed out that the translator may have been more familiar with Ukrainian than with Belarusian, uh, Krimsky being uh, the Ukrainian. Um, how one actually told in the Grand Duchy of Lithuanian who was more familiar with Belarusian and who was more familiar with Ukrainian is very, very hard to tell. <coughs> the text of the Tainai Tainik, like that of all the Judaizer translations, is very literal uh, and uh, sometimes inaccurately translated, with many difficulties, lacunae, and interpolations. Uh, why it was translated and its reception and uh, fortuna in Russia will be the subject of my paper in the forthcoming conference. I should only say here, because it is relevant to some parts of what follows, that Professor Tauber has presented the startling 
but convincingly argued claim in recent articles on the subject that the Judaizer translations were the work of Zechari ben Aaron HaKohen of Kiev, probably at some time after 1470, he came to Novgorod, and were part of a subtle conspiracy, and here I quote Professor Tauber, uh, he can dis disown this if he wishes, um, it was orchestrated by learned, G by learned Jews from the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth with mystic inclinations. Um, I sometimes like to visualize the meeting in which this took place, <laughs> I was, uh, these learned Jews uh, conspiring to, trend, to convert the whole of, uh, of Muscovy. It must have been quite an interesting meeting. <coughs> This was, in fact, a plan to convert the Moscow Grand Principality under Ivan III um, to Judaism by presenting him and his inner circle with literary evidence of superior Jewish philosophical, scientific, particularly astronomical knowledge. At a time when there was a serious uh, eschatological alarm among the Russian Orthodox and to some extent in the rest of Europe about the end of the seventh millennium, the end of the calendar, and therefore the end of the world. Why Jews should want to convert Russians to Judaism is, ex is explained, um, is possibly explained, by the particular school of millenarian thought of Rabbi Moses the Exile in Kiev, um, with whom Zechariah had studied, which placed a high value on converts as instruments of redemption. One has to say that if Professor Tauber's suggestion is correct, uh, I accept it as being a, a, an imaginative um, suggestion, and there's no other good explanation. Um, if it's correct, then uh, Zechariah's optimism was extraordinary, and his choice of text was bizarre, um, except perhaps for the Tainai Tainai, which, for reasons which I hope may emerge, but just by luck or good judgment, has been a clever choice. The Russians did know a little bit about Aristotle, uh, partly from references in short sight of the articles in Flore Legia, aphorisms from the translated Greek uh, floral legend called the Melissa, and in John Damascene, but mainly from the Chronicles and the Alexander Romance of pseudo calistes known in Russian as the Alexandria, which in one version was actually incorporated into Chronicles. This was probably the most read and most copied non-religious text in Russia right up to the 17th century, and the portrayal of Alexander and Aristotle is very positive. Alexander was a medieval hero, and Aristotle was his wise mentor. It was also a time, not long after the fall of Constantinople, when Moscow was expanding, looking for a new role as the leading Orthodox state, looking, like other states in Renaissance Europe, for historical models and dynastic legitimacy, and beginning to be aware of new ideas from abroad. Now let me turn to the question of esoteric knowledge and its transmission. <coughs> esoteric knowledge means usually a hidden religious or magic doctrine which is known only to a restricted elite, or slightly more generally, any occult or arcane knowledge. Secret knowledge which must not be revealed to ordinary people is often claimed by mystical religious, religious sects or secret societies such as Freemasons. Often the claim is no more than an attempt to raise the value of some social group, or in the case of texts, uh, to claim some special expertise such as prophecy or divination, with curses placed on anyone who reveals the secrets of the book, or stealing or losing it. Book curses are in fact quite common in medieval texts. How much of our Taina Taina text is indeed esoteric, we can examine step by step. The introduction to the main text of the Taina Taina is a mixture of the topos of ancient, secret, and possibly divine origin, and an attribution to a famous authority, Aristotle. This, of course, together with the intriguing title, such as The Secret of Secrets, is a book marketing trick which is still widely used. I think of Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code, for example. Some years ago, I found three recently published popular pamphlets of the so-called Oracle of Napoleon, which is a kind of geomancy, uh, in the university bookshop in London. Uh, each of them had, as a preface, a separate, quite separate, myth of origin. Um, essentially a claim that the editor's distinguished ancestor, a nobleman or a general in Napoleon's army, or perhaps Napoleon's doctor, had found it in an Egyptian tomb during Napoleon's Egyptian campaign. Now, this is not an entirely frivolous um, digression here. 
uh, a fabulous Egyptian origin is quite important in the history of this text. <coughs> the introduction to the Tainai Tainik says that the scribe Yahya ibn al bitriq a well-known 9th century translator, at the command of the Caliph had searched for this book, which was written in letters of gold, and found it in the Temple of the Sun, which had been built by Hermes. This is Hermes Trismegistus, the legendary sage, and supposedly the founder of the science of alchemy, not the Greek god, although the two do get mixed up in hermetic literature. The Temple of the Sun may be Heliopolis, and this, as Professor Moshe Edel has noted in a pretty interesting article on mystical cities, uh, was called in the book of Jeremiah, Beth Shemesh. Uh, I noticed somewhere called Beth Shemesh on the road the other day going up here. Mm. Uh, which is the Temple of the Sun, and it did indeed have a temple of Hermes, Hermes Thoth, Egyptian Thoth is the same as Hermes, and a famous library. Alternatively, it might have been Baalbek, which also had a, a shrine of Hermes, or it may simply be a topos of Hermetic literature. The temple built by Hermes also occurs in the famous Arabic black magic manual known in Latin as the Picatrix. <coughs> the book in letters of gold is a more exotic detail to emphasize the exclusive nature of the text. In Byzantium, there were special imperial manuscripts on pearlum with letters in silver and gold, and gold letters were similarly used in important Ottoman documents. The author of the introduction next says that he translated the Secret of Secrets um, to Arabic for the Caliph. He goes on to give details of the history of the work. Alexander described son of Nicholas and called the Hornet, the Arabic Dul Karnai. Although the significance of this reference to Alexander's alleged descent from the god Ammon would probably not have been understood by our readers, in fact certainly would have been understood. Um, this reference to exotic, magical, and possibly divine origin is of some interest for the, later interest for the later history of the Russian version of the text because it corresponds closely with the story in the Slavonic version of pseudo in the Alexandria. This also emphasizes the Egyptian claims to be the source of occult knowledge through Nectanebus, who was the last Egyptian pharaoh and who was uh, genu generally reputed to have been a magician and the father of Alexander after he had ravished Olympias disguised as the god Ammon. Um, it's quite a racy text, actually, the Alexandria. It should be remembered that in the 16th century propaganda of grand princes of, uh, of Muscovy and later the Tsar, um, that they were descended uh, from the family of Augusta, also included in the Skazania of uh, a little noticed claim that Augustus had been vested with the regalia of the pharaohs, and thus was also the successor of Alexander. And such details are not included in stories without a good reason, and not in the Renaissance anyway. <coughs> with regard to Tanebus and his reputation as a wizard and his connection with uh, a hidden book of wisdom, uh, I would also draw attention to a passage in roughly, uh, this is the name of a very interesting and curious 16th century divinatory compendium, mostly geomancy, which was published by Chernesov and Turilov in 1985, and the, origi the origins of which are still unidentified. The Rashi also shows signs of Jewish or Arabic origin uh, in some parts, and possibly familiarity with the Tainai Tain. This work claims, in fact, the, the Rashi that claims, in fact, to be the scroll of wisdom brought by Gabriel to Seth, which contained knowledge of the sun, the moon, the planets, and the zodiac. The descendants of Seth were supposed to have guarded this knowledge for 2,000 years. They built two columns in Assyria, one of stone, one of clay. Uh, the stone column uh, was found by the sons of Noah after the flood. They took the scroll and read it, and built the Tower of Babel in Babylon in case of the flood. The Assyrians used the tower for astronomical observations, and from them the Hellenic kings and Aristotle and the wizard Nectimus and Ptolemy in Egypt and the wise men of Persia derived their wisdom which comes from the stars. And this book is called Rafi. Okay, so this, this story of um, occult wisdom concealed in pillars is an ancient motif which was investigated in detail by Festugier, who was the great historian of hermetic literature. Uh, the particular story of the two pillars of stone and clay, which is mentioned uh, by Josephus in his Jewish Antiquities, 
has a long and fantastic tradition in Arabic, where in one version the two pillars become the Kaaba in, 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 Me in Mecca, and also exists in Latin and, and vernacular literatures in the West. Um, even the famous English chemist Robert Boyle in the 17th century appears to have believed in it literally. But to return to Tainai Tainich, uh, 